Okay, now the express points the south section are finished. I'm using the same switch panel that I used before. So power input is these red and black lines. And then you've got the switching wire into there. I'm using chop blocks underneath so I don't have to do any soldering actually under the board upside down. Um, the yellow line is the feed from the switch and the blue is a common return. So they go through to that point unit there to operate that one and then lines come off of there again blue and yellow for a feed and return to the other express point. So both points are operating from the same switch but they've each got their own individual capacitor to make sure there's enough power to um, throw the switch properly. Um, I've used the chop blocks on the wire that comes underneath the pico frog from the sorry, the pico point from the frog and then use a grain cable to attach that to the unit there which will then switch the power depending on which way the points are set. Right, you've got the switch on the side of the board and I haven't decided whether I'm going to have a single point board in one location or one per section we'll think about that later on. Um, just to show Hopefully we can, we can hear, they're both throwing, we should throw and throw at the same time, and we're getting good throw action. If you've seen my previous videos you'll know that the layout used to be on the floor of the conservatory and the power was supplied by these type of connectors. Now that's fine if you've got a temporary layout because what you're doing then is relying on the fish plates which are these metal connectors that go between the track rails to conduct electricity between the sections of track so the whole layout can be powered by one or two of these clips. With a temporary layout that's fine because if an electrical fault develops and part of the track isn't powered you can just lift up the track change the fish plates but this layout, the permanent layout it's going to be pinned down and then ballasted so it'll be very difficult to lift it up to make any changes so what I've decided to do is to have every section of track powered separately by its own wiring so this is the um, layout as it will be finished with all the track um, I've split it up into zones zone 1 is the outer loop zone 2 is the inner loop with some extras on Zone 3 will be the tunnel, Zone 4 the goods yard, Zone 5 the TMD and Zone 6 is the programming track. In practical terms separation of the zone is achieved using these plastic fish plates which allow isolation of separate sections of track. Because I'm wiring up each piece of track individually there's several ways this could be done. I could simply have a wire that runs to each piece of track, but clearly that's an awful lot of wire, or I could have a single bus which is quite a common approach and then link in wires to that. But the approach I've gone for is to have like a what I call a leapfrog approach which has the least wiring of all but also allows each section of track to be disconnected via the terminal blocks and achieves the same result overall. So all you need to start soldering is a soldering iron, ideally a stand which includes these sponges that you can keep wet, some solder and also have a dry cloth that I use. I've had this soldering iron for about 30 years and um, it's always been very reliable. I did put a new tip on it um, last year, they're very cheap. This is the solder I'm using, um, it's standard tin and lead solder but it has got the flux inside the solder. For electrical or electronic soldering, there's two types of solder, there's ones with flux and ones without. You can buy flux separately and then apply it with a brush to whatever components you're soldering. And the purpose of the flux is to eat away at oxide on metal so that the solder's got good electrical contact. Um, it serves the same purpose whether it's separate or inside the solder. Now personally I've always used solder that's got the flux in it. And I see there's a couple of big advantages that I think of doing it that way is that um, if you put the flux on by a brush you can spill it onto metal and it will corrode the metal or it may not all get eaten up by the soldering process. 
The advantage of having it inside the solder here is that you always get flux to the point where the solder is working. But the disadvantage is that the flux actually burns away and once the flux is all gone, your solder won't flow very efficiently. Another really useful item I have is these fiberglass pencils which have a, an abrasive tip which is superb for let me just get that to focus there, which is superb for getting oxide off of metal components. You need to make sure that you keep the soldering iron tip clean. You can do that by wiping it onto the damp sponge, you can do it hissing away so you get a nice shiny surface and also I've got a dry cloth which acts in a similar way. It's not so much of an issue when carrying out soldering on large components with delicate electronic components you've got to be really careful because they can be damaged by heat so you've got to solder quickly so before the heat gets into the components. Now with track that's not too much of a problem that it can melt plastic sleepers. But the other issue with soldering, especially with this uh, flux cord solder, is that the soldering will only work efficiently while there's flux burning. You can see as soon as I put it on lots of smoke comes off. That smoke is the flux burning away because the solder itself won't vaporise. The iron is just not hot enough. But now you can see all the smoke has stopped which means all the flux is gone. So you have to work while there's flux still in the solder otherwise it won't flow properly. And That's how quickly you have to work. You can add more to introduce more flux but all you're doing is adding more and more solder. So the trick is to work quickly and if you need to practice extensively on spare components before you actually do the work for real. When it comes to wiring, there's something I want to tell you. For years I've used this kind of wire stripper where you squeeze them together, it forms a tiny hole in the end and then you're able to pull on the wire. The problem with these is that with a short piece of wire like this, it's very difficult to get a grip on the end and still strip the end of the wire. You see how that's come off there? It does work, but it's difficult. Before I started the wiring on the track, I bought these. And I wish I'd bought a set of these about 30 years ago when I first started in electronics because these are fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Even with a really short piece of wire like this, it'll work. You simply put the wire in between where the teeth are. This section grips the wire. This section closes around it with the teeth. And this section here controls how long the cut section is. And in a one-handed operation, you just squeeze and it's pulled insulation off the wire and then when you let go it flings it off into the bin or into the corner and it'll work with a really short piece. These are brilliant. They're about, I got this for about £12. You can get them in uh, places like Screwfix or Tool Station or Maplins and if you haven't got a set of these and you're doing wiring then get some. So for each of the terminal blocks on the droppers there's going to be two wires that meet and all I'm going to do is twist those wire together so they meet like that and then solder them. Another really useful item to have is this hands-free stand with crocodile clips for holding items while you're soldering or doing other work. It keeps your hands free. You'll notice that I'm using a piece of card folded over here to wrap around the wires. This serves two purposes. It means that you get a wider grip on the teeth and also stops the teeth of the clip from digging into the insulation. Now the key thing about soldering is that the solder will only go where it's hot. So what you have to do is to get all the components, in this case the wiring, up to temperature. But that takes time. Now the quickest way to do that is to put liquid solder onto the metal. That will mean that there's good surface contact between the solder and the component, in this case the wire, so the heat will transfer really quickly. And the way I do this is the first thing I do is take the soldering iron, make sure it's clean, and then I add solder to the tip. That forms a liquid blob of hot metal, and then I apply that to the components and then add more solder and because everything's really hot because it's in contact with the liquid solder the extra solder will then quickly flow around. The advantage of this wiring is because it's copper coloured you can see it goes shiny silver when it's been covered in solder. Now you don't need a huge amount of solder in terms of soldering a wiring like this, what ideally you want to be able to see is the individual strands that are inside the solder. It also means that the 
core you've got here is not going to be too thick to actually go into the terminal blocks. You don't need a lot of solder.